Welcome to the service. I am very glad that you're here. I'm glad that I'm here too. If you are online and you just stumbled across this, this is Whitehorse United Church in Whitehorse in the Yukon. And we are most delighted to welcome you to this service. Whether this is your first time here or you're here with us every week or somewhere in between, it's wonderful to be together. To be in a space, virtual or otherwise, where someone will, in the same sentence, speak your name and the name of God. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or who you've been. It doesn't matter who you love, who's in your family, where you were born, to whom. It doesn't matter if you have anything to put on the offering plate, if you have your beliefs all figured out, or if you're still working on that. Just come in and be with us. And welcome, especially if you're wondering what it's all about. If it means anything at all, life I mean, and if it's worth it. If you're wondering right now if you have what it takes to go on, if you can hang on, if that's where your heart is right now, please hang on. Please hang on, because we're here, and you're not alone, and we're not perfect, that's for sure, but we're here. And the power of people gathered online or in person their power in that is unspeakable, and so is the hope. Sometimes you think you can't go on, and sometimes all you hear is silence when you cry out. Sometimes the voice of God is clear and loud. And sometimes all you get is silence. But listen to the silence, if that's where you are, because God's there as well. You'll hear your own beating heart. And that in itself is a miracle. Right there, that's a sign. Your heart knows everything you feel, and yet it just keeps on beating. So whatever it is that you need today, thank you for being here. It means more than you know. And I pray that what we do this morning will be a blessing, will be at least part of the way that the Holy One, the Creator, the Spirit of life, and reconciliation and justice and all the good stuff is working in your life. So we're going to open ourselves to the sounds and to the silence, and I invite us all to go deep into the awe and the mystery that is so much bigger than us all. Let's worship God, and let's do that by listening to some more beautiful music. The hymn is 44. your image or 
Psalm 19 is the given psalm for today, and I love it because it's, it just invites us into the expanse of it's talking about the Word of God and the law of God, and it begins by just making it clear that that is so much wider and expansive. The whole universe is expressing the law of God. Anyway, listen to it. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. Well, there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from a wedding canopy and like a strong person runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of our God is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of our God is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of our God are right, Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of our God is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of our God is pure, enduring forever. The judgments of our God are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults and keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do, do not let them have dominion over me. And then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. We're going to continue our worship by reminding ourselves that Jesus is the light of the world. Yep, we are. And we'll remind ourselves as well that when we worship together, God's word is always here among us, and God's word is a living word. And finally, remind ourselves that God loves the whole world so much. And let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for this day and for every day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in this way, for the miracle of how it feels when we're physically together, and for the miracle of being able to connect online. We thank you that they're all connections, all true connections are from you. Thank you. Thank you that you call us to be people of uh, courage and integrity, truth-telling and justice, keepers of your law. We confess to you that there are often times when we turn away or we forget where we are not fully the people you created us to be. And when we have forgotten your law, your law which is embedded in the very creation, when we have forgotten who we are in your sight, that we are blessed to be a blessing, we need 
your forgiveness. We need to be called back to your way, called back to the mountain, called back to the truth, to home. Forgive us as a church, forgive us as a society, and forgive us as individuals. Forgive us and free us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, in trust and in hope. Amen. Listen, there's good news. God loves you very much. And no matter what, God is always there for you, loving you and calling you and forgiving you and giving you just what you need right now to be God's loving and joyful and faithful people. And so it is, I can assure you, that our sins are forgiven and thanks be to God and there's hope. Amen. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you always. And if you would turn to one another, please, in the ways that are safe, and wish one another the peace of Christ. And the hymn is 79.
gospel reading first from John and then go back to the Exodus reading. It's uh, John chapter 2, so very early in in the gospel, and beginning at 13. Just so you know, Jesus has just turned water into wine at that wedding. Then it says, the Passover was near, And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. And he also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making God's house a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And then some said to him, what sign can you give us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And they said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So I'm not preaching on that. But I kind of am, so here's, my, here's what I'm not preaching. I, I just can't let it go without comment. So, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, together they're called the synoptics, if, if you like words like that. Unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who put this incident at the very end of Jesus' life, right before, almost the thing that pr- finally pr- prompts the people to arrest him, John says it was the second public thing that he did. The first was changing water into wine. All of the gospel writers, all four of them, are writing about it after the temple had been demolished by the Romans in the year 70. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the point seems to be that Jesus was angry about the abuses and injustices going on in the temple. In John, it seems to me that that is not his point. He seems to be addressing not the abuses but the whole system. Uh, for Jewish people, this is not a diatribe against Jews. Can you, this is not a diatribe against Jews. 
But for the Jews at that time, the temple was understood to be the dwelling place of God, the place where heaven and earth meet. And after the temple's destruction, yet again, uh, Judaism had to ask itself, how do we understand now where God is? Where now is the dwelling place of God? Where is it that heaven and earth meet now that the temple is gone? And John and the early Christian community had come to their own conclusions about that, and they would answer, in Jesus. In Jesus, God, heaven and earth meet. In Jesus, God became flesh, and as Eugene Peterson said, moved into the neighborhood. God is to be met in human flesh, Jesus and our own. So I read this account as an invitation for us to ask that same question. Where is God to be found? So that's my non-sermon on John. Here's the, here's the Exodus reading. I'm going to start at Exodus 19. The people have been wandering. Moses, Miriam, and Aaron are leading them. They've been wandering in the wilderness after their escape from Egypt, and now they've come to the foot of a mountain. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because God had descended upon it in fire, and the smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln while the whole mountain shook. And as the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak and God would answer in thunder. And when God descended upon the mountain to the top of the mountain, God summoned Moses to the top. And Moses went up. And then God said to Moses, go down there and warn the people not to break through to to God and look. Otherwise, many of them will perish. And even the priests who approach the God must consecrate themselves. And Moses said to God, God, the people are not permitted to come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us. So Moses went down to the people and told them these things. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol, whether it is in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of God, for God will not acquit anyone who misuses that name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your town. For in six days God made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, God blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's slave, your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So through Lent, the scripture readings, the Hebrew scripture readings, are taking us through a series of covenants that offer some light as we consider the question, where does God dwell now? Today we're going to move to holding up the Exodus account of the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments themselves, and the story of Israel receiving them. Let me offer you an image as we move into that text. 
What are the Ten Commandments and how should we consider them? Martin Luther, in the 1500s, directed that they should be read at every single worship service right before the prayer of confession, anticipating that we had broken at least one of those since the last worship service, I think. Um, John Calvin also expected that they be read at each service, but he said they should be read after the assurance of pardon. Uh, many people have offered images. Like, they're like strong poles for the tent of society, someone says. Without strong tent poles, you can have a lovely canvas, but it's not going to hold up. You're going to have a puddle of canvas, that's all. Or, they're like a fence preventing us from stepping into dangerous places. Or, they're sweet, like honey, sweet to the tongue, sweeter than the honey in the comb, as the psalmist says. Or, having the promise and grace of God without the law is like having fresh, clean water with no cup to hold it in. Here's one. This is mine now, and it comes from the one of the times that we uh, explored this, one time during Lent, our theme was mending. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, Ruth sat up here and just simply mended through every service. People start bringing her stuff to mend. Like, I know. And when a person is good at mending, not only do they fix broken places, mend the rips and tears and snags, but they also look at a garment see its strengths and weaknesses, and anticipate where the weak seams are and where pressure might make them come apart. And a good mender sees that before it happens and reinforces the seams. Sews the button on more tightly before it comes off. Does that make sense? So the commandments, let me offer, are like that. They see the place that we're likely to get ourselves into trouble. They know human nature. They know us as a whole garment, as it were. And they're very honest that way, honest about our humanity, the places we're likely to mess up, and they reinforce the seam. They tighten the stitches that will keep us closer to one another and to God, our creator, and that will help us to love God with all our fragile, vulnerable human hearts. So just to back up for a bit, how did we get here to the foot of that smoking mountain? The readings, this Lent tide, are taking us through the covenants made by God with the people. Covenants themselves call us to a unity. The co means together, then means to come, like vent, anyway, to come together, covenant. Uh, just like religion, that word conjures up ideas of judgment and rigid and so on, but literally at its best, it means to bring together. The re means again, and the lig, uh, root as in ligament, means to join, to, so to rejoin. Anyway, it's a beautiful thing, this series of covenants, and God always initiates them, and God, here's, God says, I'll be your God, and you be my people. And we agree, and the covenant is signed and sealed by signs in the heavens, a rainbow, the stars, in here, smoke and lightning, and time after time after time, we break our end of the deal, and God begins again. For example, we began with the covenant God made with Noah, his family, and the whole earth after the flood, and the sign and the seal of that covenant was the rainbow, sign of unity sign of bridging heaven and earth. God makes that covenant with all the earth. For our part, we're to live as though it's true, that the whole earth belongs to God. So what happened? Yeah, uh, we broke it. We don't, we didn't live like that, as though everyone belongs, as though we are one with the earth. And so God tries again. Maybe God thinks, maybe if I started with a small group of people who could learn and model that and be my chosen people, not to be better than others or more loved, but maybe they could learn and shine like the stars and show others the way. Do you think that might work? So God calls Sarah and Abraham and says, 
I'll be your God, and you be my people. And here's what I'll do, and God promises three things. A land, and children, as many as the stars in the sky, and the third thing, that God would never leave them. And God says, and as for you, I need you to follow and trust and be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Do they do that? Yes and no. Uh, they do follow, and years pass, and Abram and Sarah do have a child against all expectations, and his name is Isaac, which means laughter. Years pass, and we read of family brokenness and cheating and betrayal and violence. The Bible is so honest, painfully so, about our frailty and the inconsistency of our hearts. Anyway, they end up in Egypt, in slavery. And they're led out of there. They escape from Egypt by, uh, by Moses and Miriam and Aaron, and they escape in a miraculous parting of the sea. And speaking of human frailty, after that, they, they sing and they dance, and then the next thing they do is complain about the food. Finally, in the midst of that wandering, we get this scene. We had broken the covenant with Noah. I'll be your God and you be my people. All the earth is mine. Live that way. Yeah, we broke that. We had broken the covenant with Sarah and Abraham. I'll be your God and you be my people. Learn to trust and walk with me and be a blessing to all the world. Yeah, we broke that too. And God says now, so here's an idea. I'll be your God and you be my people. And how about this? I'll make it easy for you. Here are ten words for you. Ten gifts that will help you respect one another and the earth. Ten words of life. Do you think you could manage that? So we've read the account. It stands alone, certainly, in many ways. And it's perhaps the most well-known of the biblical teachings, or at least, if not known, people know about them. People will fight for the right to post them in public places, but if you ask them what they are... The, Anyway, I digress. What is there to say about all of this? Again, with the psalmist, the law of our God is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of our God is sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. They're given amidst smoke and cloud. These are not unfamiliar signs. They're God's calling cards, smoke and fire and thunder. These are not meant to intimidate, to frighten or repel, but to say, it's me, remember? I'm the one who led you by a pillar of fire and a cloud in the wilderness. I'm the one who passed between the halves of the animal as I made covenant with your ancestors. Smoke and fire is how you knew me then too. I'm the one who appeared in a burning bush to Moses. These laws are not being given by some angry, distant lord, sword drawn to punish, but by one they've always known. El Shaddai, translated God of the mountains, sometimes translated the God with breasts. The Holy One who birthed them, held their hands as they learned to walk, heard them when they cried out, fed them with manna in the wilderness, and promised them, I'll never leave you ever. I'll be your God, you be my people, and this is how I need you to live. This is what you were made for. These laws have the feeling of intimate knowledge. God knows those people, knows us, where we're likely to be weak. The kinds of things that are tempting to us and that lead to pain in the end, no matter how we rationalize it in the moment. Places where we break apart and tear open and hurt one another, God knows us. To a very broken people, God offers this sweet, gracious gift. In Hebrew, the language is intimate and gives a feeling almost like talking to children. We say, thou shalt not steal. In Hebrew, it's like no stealing, no lying, no hitting your brother, like that. that 
That's the feel of the Hebrew, I'm told. These laws are simple in the extreme. Ten things to make life sweet, to honor God and our neighbor, reinforcing the seams of a garment that holds us together as a society. This is what we're made for. Responsible living, caring for each other, making sure we keep our priorities clear, know who and what comes first in life. That's sweet like honey. And inside, we knew that all along. The keeping of the law draws from us an inner light, pure and bright from deep inside, and draws it out into the sunlight where it meets the sunshine and refracts into colors so beautiful it would put stars in your eyes. May God richly bless you, and may you know the sweetness and grace of the Holy One who loves you until the stars refuse to shine. Amen. So this is where uh, the offering naturally comes. It comes right after we've heard the word because it's meant to be a response to that word. Not a rating of the sermon, but a, a, a response from a thankful heart for the word of God received. And that's up to you to decide how you respond, how you give graciously and generously in thanksgiving for your blessings. And if you choose to, uh, to do that by giving a, a gift to White Horse United Church, then I thank you very much for that. And I promise you that we will uh, use it responsibly and faithfully. And if you choose to give that, some, there are so many places where God is working to mend the world. So bless your hearts as you think about that. The hymn is 117.
And let's pray together. God, once again, we thank you for your presence with us and for the gift of this day and for all of the opportunities that there have been and yet will be in this day to serve you, to do a generous thing, to say a kind word, to reach out in the ways that we can. Thank you that you ask us to shine, to be a blessing as we have been so richly blessed. Thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to come together in prayer for those we're holding in our hearts. So many people. For those who are grieving. We ask comfort and courage. For those who are ill in any way, we ask comfort and courage. For those who are struggling with the injustices of this world. We ask comfort and courage. We pray that you will make us agents of that comfort, agents of that courage, that we will live our lives as signs of the covenant, live our lives in a way that turns over tables when they need to be overturned, speaks truth, we pray for your world, all of it every place, your earth, your world, is the place where heaven and earth meet. This life, human flesh, all flesh, has come together. We pray for places where there's hunger and war and illness and so many things that are unfair and unnecessary. We thank you for prophets who rage in the streets. We pray now for our own families and friends. We, th we pray for any with whom we have difficult relationships. We pray for ourselves. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, in trust and in hope, and as he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So let's go from here now, knowing who we are and whose we are. Let's go with hope 
and a fierce determination to live life as a good gift from a good God. And let's go in joy, because God has promised to be with us always. Amen. 427.